gets even more exciting. Well, yeah, mystery is great. Yeah. Um, all right, so what I thought we, I would do is kind of go through the process starting from pre-production of voice to production of recording the voice, and then going into post-production and implementation, all for games and how that differs from film versus games and kind of the problems that we have in games and some of the better things about why you should be doing games. Uh, so hopefully that'll be a good coverage. And then hopefully at the end we'll have time for your questions, which I'm sure you'll be here to ask. So um, starting with uh, pre-production and, and scripts. So you have, you have a game, got to write a script. Uh, what do you find is the best format for a script for the talent to read as well as staying organized through the implementation stage? Is it spreadsheets or are there certain tools that game audio people use that don't? But uh, how do you start from the beginning there? Anybody? Ariel. Okay, go. Uh, so <coughs> we do spreadsheets because that's what the recording studio asked for us. So basically, I, 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 on our most recent project that I was working on, we went in with a bunch of like, uh, like physical stuff. You know, like we had like, here's your script. You know, it was like in a manila envelope and it was all like, we, you know, here it is. And then uh, and they were like, where's the spreadsheet? So we basically set up a spreadsheet uh, the way that it was organized is essentially uh, we have some, I mean, what we take to the, what we send to the studio basically has uh, the content of the line, uh, some kind of direction at a really high level. Uh, it has uh, the file name and then it has uh, uh, the preceding line, if I'm not mistaken. It kind of depends. So we typically have two separate types of scripts. We have ones that are like groups of lines that you would say that would be chosen at random when you when you play the line. So if if you've got, you know, like someone saying, uh, help me up, you know, or something like that, and you have like five different variations of that, that might go on a certain type of script, but then when you have like a story script that has linear stuff, we usually do a separate tab or, or, or spreadsheet um, that allows them to see at least their preceding line, if not like the whole thing and then their line mixed into it. That's what we do. So video game uh, recording of speech is really complex, and the fact that you have to obey this one rule in audio, in game audio, and that is, thou shall not annoy. So if you just record a script verbatim, just like a linear story, you usually don't have a lot of room to make it interactive. So one of the tips that we eventually figured out was, uh, you know, sure, write your script as you think it, or at least the things that are most important. Um, but also provide the talent scenarios and let them ad lib stuff and have some examples in case they you know get locked up but that will give you way more variety in your script than just the, the physical thing and then if you decide that you're going into the game and you're like oh yeah let's make this open world now or something like that um, and your characters running through the same zone again they're not hearing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again and it makes the game sound more intelligent so so how do you deal with, like, if there is everything completely written out for every line, do you allow for ad-libs? And if so, do you document that then, like, into the script? Or, like, how does that all work? Uh, usually you document the ad-libs on top of your regular script. So the most important thing you can do when you're recording your talent is uh, whether you're the engineer or you're the producer looking over the engineer's uh, shoulder as you're going through the script, pay attention to the time code that's like rolling on that recording and write the time code down and write what you thought about the line. Because when you're doing a video game, that could be like a phone book size script and going back through it, it nobody wants to do that. So it's easier to say, hey, I really like these set of takes. You have time code, they can go right to it, they can extract everything you need and it's extremely efficient. Mm -hmm. I think audio people like ad libs. I've worked with some writers that were less, you know, excited about that because they're like, you know, they want to preserve the exact, yeah. the exact. This line. is their creation. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This is my baby. <clears throat> Don't honestly, touch my like, baby. Yeah, but the best. I feel like a lot of the best lines, it's like where the magic happens, is when they when the voice actor is allowed to kind of like roll with what feels natural yeah. to the character when they're yeah. new characters. Definitely. When you let them play. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, based on time code, mm -hmm. it also depends on where the game is made. There are some games that are made in Japan, and if they've already got Japanese uh, script or Japanese dialogue already set, then you've got to make sure that you're matching flaps or you've got to make sure that you're matching that time code. Uh, some games are also made in India or Korea or China. So again, time code is incredibly important. And 
your ability to match the time or whatever that expression is that the other um, VO talent has already done, but then be able to be flexible and of course convey emotion and be expressive while doing that within that specific time, like, like down to the, the what, hundredth of a second, mm -hmm. uh, it really makes a difference. So, Is there anything in the script that you see um, or that you've seen in the past that maybe uh, you shouldn't do or, or like as a reader of the script, what are you expecting? As a reader of the script? As the talent that has to like, like you get in like eight point font and it's totally dark. <laughs> yeah, or... definitely don't do that. Yeah. Uh, and yet they do all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that happens now, especially with the spreadsheets, at least, at least it's backlit. Um, what really matters is as a talent, you want to give your best to the director, to everybody that's, that's recording you. The challenge can come when you've got a new director and they don't necessarily know what they want and so, as a voice talent, you have to be empathic. You have to be extremely empathic and take direction well. And a lot of times the director might not necessarily know how to communicate and convey exactly what they want. And so you're gonna do everything you can to, you know, to really stretch your boundaries and stretch your abilities. The most important thing though is do not blow your voice out early. Uh, save the yelling and the roaring and, the, and the, you know, the action and the reactions for later on in the session. Try to get through the, the script. Know that you need to get through the script as, um, as a, a, a talented actor while you can, and then save the best for last. Absolutely, and if you're a, a good audio producer or audio director, you will format your script that way. Even right. if the lines come in that order, know that this is gonna be the stuff that's gonna be really hard on them, and put that at the end, yep. or by, before lunch, or something like that, <laughs> <Yes>. you know? <laughs> Give yep. them time to recover. Um. Okay, so moving on to the actual talent and finding the talent. How? What's the best way? I'm assuming there's a lot of VO like voice actors in the audience here. So, uh, how do you find your talent uh, as a studio, and how do you find like where's most of your work coming from? Are it agents or are they studios? Is it one-on-one -on -one contact? What's the best way to approach that? Um, I teach that you, again, nobody cares about your business like you and your mom, and your mom can't help you market, so that means it's up to you. Yes, you'll, if you're already established, you'll have actors, and I mean, you'll, you'll have agents, but even an agent is only gonna account for 10 to 20% of your work. So by making a personal relationship, by making an introduction at Siege, or by um, reaching out to somebody and introducing yourself and letting them know that you're going to be a resource for them, that has been that's been my path to success, and uh, and it's worked for me. And honestly, the Georgia Game Developers Association as well. Uh, this has been an incredible resource. As a matter of fact, um, that's kind of how I met Chris. You know, well, it was a referral. Uh, how I first met Chris, and then through the GGDA, that's how I met uh, the guys at Wabi Sabi Sound, and I ended up getting Destiny 2. Um, but I'm a big believer in networking, and so I think events like this are fantastic. I, I am totally going to say that's the best way to go if you're a voice talent is to get into where the people who are doing the thing you want to be a part of is. And that doesn't matter what you're interested in, whether you're an artist or anything, but especially as a voice talent coming to uh, independent game developing conferences or any kind of game conferences and just talking to people is the best because as a producer, uh, you know, you'll get a request of like, here, you know, we need these many characters, whatever. And if you literally have no one in your network, you're just calling an agency and saying, okay, we're going to do a cattle call. We need voiceover talents that are like this. And it takes forever to go through all that. And then you have to kind of make a blind decision where it's cooler if, you know, you're like, I've seen this guy at several of the conventions and, you know, he's really, it seems professional. He's got a great voice, that kind of thing. Um, that's a far better way to go. So for the last, <coughs> excuse me, last couple projects I've worked on, we have, let's see, we would have a casting director, essentially, you know, um, so we work with Warner Bros, and they have a casting director that would basically, well, what we do on our end is we write up audition sides and say, you know, these are our characters in our game. This is like the relevant, we actually go overboard to where I'm at now, where we say like, here's all their backstory and here's like what their feelings are and here's what they have in their pockets, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Cool. And then uh, and then, <clears throat> and then, then we send that off to her, or, or Warner, I should say. And they uh, do, they basically, because we don't have 
I don't really have the time to listen to a ton of auditions, so what they'll do is they'll listen to a bunch of the audition, or they'll elicit auditions, you know, from, from, uh, from voice actors, and then they send us what they consider to be the best fits. And then they also send us everything. So then I will listen to, you know, it's probably six maybe or so uh, uh, auditions per character that are like their selects. And then if, and, it, and it's not just me listening, it would be me and usually a creative director and a writer. Uh, and honestly, we're, it's kind of a startup, so there's a lot of people on our team listening. We t take all the feedback. And then, um, <clears throat> And if we don't like any of those, then we start digging into the bigger list. And then sometimes we do have special requests. You know, we're like, we really feel like this person would be perfect for it. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's always some pie in the sky thing. <laughs> we think Morgan Freeman would be perfect. You know? <laughs> uh, but so, and then at that point, um, we make our choices and we start recording. How about so, you, Chris? How do I find them? I yeah. go through Ocatron. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I. I always tell people it's good to know it's good to have an agent because they will you will get called for those cattle calls. Uh, and for Smite, that's what we do. We, I go to, to Chris at Ocatron and say, "Here's the six guys we need this week. Go for it." And they will send out. Uh, they have three agents. They have one in Dallas. They have one in LA, and they have one in New York. And they send in auditions, and we get like 20 to 25 auditions per voice. And we go through, listen to them. Or the, the producers will listen to them. Pick their guy, see if he's available, and then go. And that's super fast. Uh, so I say getting get getting good with studios that do voiceover because then they'll be on your first call list. Like, oh, I know. Like Crystal said, I know who could do this voice. Like it's this guy. Use him or use her. And then uh, if that's not the case, then you know they'll go to the agents. But a lot of it comes from just uh, Chris and his team knowing their voices and who they've used over and over again. They're like, yeah, this is perfect for that. Yep. Yeah. And once you get on that short list, you're going to get called all the time. That's that's what I teach my students. You want to be on their short list. And everybody has a short list of people that they talk to all the time. You want to be on the director's short list. So now my goal is to get on their short list right after this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Practice what I preach. <laughs> So speaking of like demos and auditioning, what can they, what can people do on their general demos, or what should be on there, and even on the auditions, what what should they do and not do to, to nail those auditions? What have you done? Well, I produce demos. So for a character demo, you want to make sure that you've got a character demo if you're going to do a lot of voice acting. You don't have to. You can you can book off of your commercial demo if you're just starting. But as long as you show range, emotional range. That's the important thing. It's not just about having wacky, zany voices anymore. That's not what animation is all about. It's about emotional expressiveness. Now, if you've got different styles of voices or roars that you can do, then you could put a couple of segments in there. But because casting directors and directors here voices all day, every day, you want your demo to be one minute or less, and you want to make sure that you can fit as many different segments on there as possible. So seven or eight segments of seven or eight seconds each or less um, I personally shoot for eight or nine segments, and that means that demo is going to move very quickly. You, but you want to make sure you've got emotional expressiveness. So, does that work? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The only thing I'd <clears throat> say uh, that I've that I've experienced that was not really fantastic was the kind of the opposite of that. There have been multiple auditions that I've listened to that were where they'll do like three takes. <laughs> and they all sound the same. You know what I mean? Oh, right. Which is, which, I mean, I'm not, I mean, maybe that's just, you know, that's just how it went, you know? But uh, I would say that if, if you're going to reread uh, an audition, um, which really, really try to vary it up because maybe, maybe the nuances, you're able to hear the nuance of, of, your, of your two performances, but I've been in situations where I was like, that sounds exactly, and you know, yeah. we listen to it again, do you hear something different? I feel like that's the exact same take. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's go to the next one. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is, uh, this is also something you see in sound a lot too, which is, um, I've also heard auditions where there was like music in the background, which is risky, like it has kind of worked sometimes. I don't mm -hmm. know, so, sometimes, I mean, it's, it's hard to say like do or don't, don't do it or do it, but I would say if you do send an audition that has like sound or music or something like that, I would also say send one that doesn't. Because sometimes you want to just hear the voice. Well, we yes. we absolutely must hear just the voice, and then it's it can be kind of cool to have something to like be like. And also, we're going to carry the emotion this way with some music or something. But uh, 
there, it's a little risky too because sometimes you're thinking, I don't know, is, are you trying to cover up? Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's like, am I feeling that because the music is there? You know, so. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> something to take yeah. into account. Especially when it comes to sound designers and audio guys that live sound. <laughs> I mean, you can really yeah, nitpick. So make sure you're, <laughs> just make sure your voice is clean, right? Make sure you're in a quiet place and make sure that when you send in your audition, that your audition is, number one, going to give them what they want, and then if you're going to do a wild take, that second take needs to be a wild take, something different than what they're expecting. So how do you guys feel about, I get a lot of auditions where it's obviously on their phone, uh, and in like this big cavernous living room, <laughs> where it sounds like, you know, 20 bad. feet away, yeah. Uh, how do you guys feel about, like, it, it's, it's hard to, to not judge the audio quality, but... But you, but the that you want to judge them on like their performance. How do you guys feel about that? Yeah, well, certainly the the quality of the take is going to stack against you. So if it's like a kind of a really badly recorded thing, it would be like a you know if you went to a restaurant and all of the menu was shot on a cell phone, you'd be like, I don't know, that does not look good. <laughs> so it's kind of the the same thing. So what you you know, I mean, uh, affordable audio equipment. <coughs> I mean, really, for under 100 bucks, you can get something that sounds really good. And if you need a, you know, not everybody has an isobaric chamber in their house or anything, but you have a closet and there's a lot of clothes in there, go in there, it looks silly, but you're going to get a good quality recording, and that's really what it's all about. So go for that. By the way, attend all the audio talks, because Watson Wu got a lot of mics sent to him that we're going to be giving away. So Yeah, yeah, you. so there's that. And then, uh, you know, especially when you're talking about your demo, um, book some studio time, really. I mean, it, that is something that can make you a lot of money, can start your career, you know, invest in that and uh, yeah. sit down and get something well produced. I, I will even go more extreme and say, do not, don't, don't, don't make that mistake. Like, you got to figure out a way. If you really, truly care, and this is, you're talking about your career and your dreams and all that, um, get, a, get a proper recording. I was actually talking to, to John about this earlier today. It, like, it would be nice if there was a way to to help solve that problem for people who really don't have access to audio equipment but honestly at this point i would say if you go on if you if you went on twitter and did like a hashtag game audio and said help i need help mm -hmm. I, I have to do a demo i don't have a mic someone will probably be able to help you out yeah. um <clears throat> i've i've seen so many times where the quality of the recording just killed the you're not yes. going to get it if you have a low quality uh, uh, demo, because you know even if even if the performance is good, there is a there is a message with that, you know. So it sucks, costs money, got to save up if you have to, but you got to get that get a good mic. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the closet too. That's doing your closet's fine. Yeah, <laughs> you can get a professional quality home studio setup for less than three hundred dollars. Actually, for three hundred dollars or less, as long as you've got four gigs of RAM on your computer and $300 to spend, that includes everything from the microphone, the microphone stand, the mixer, the cables, the headphones, including the two-year warranty for your headphones because they're going to break at some point. Um, and again, I, I, I coach people on how to do this sort of thing. But imagine this, okay? Imagine you're the sound designer, okay? And you're making this amazing video game. And somebody sends in, you're sending out auditions, and someone sends in an audition that is clearly on the side of the road, or it's behind some bushes, or you can hear leaf blowers <laughs> in the background, right? Or and, and they recorded it on their phone, and then someone else sends you something that sounds so clean, so pristine, you can literally use that audio right then and there. You can just drag and drop it into your video game. Nine times out of 10, guess who they're gonna pick? Actually, 10 times out of 10, who are they gonna pick? They're gonna pick the person that has the professional sounding quality equipment, right? It's a no-brainer. I mean, if you're the video game designer, you're gonna do the same thing. So. Invest in yourself. It's it's not like you're throwing your money away, and it's not like you're going to spend five or ten grand unless you're a, you know like an audiophile. We got to talk about that, all right? Um, but really, you can do it for three hundred dollars or less. So just take that time and invest it in yourself. And then the demo is anywhere between seven fifty and twenty five hundred dollars, depending on what state you're in. Mm -hmm. So, but it matters. It really matters. It and does. again, just think like a. What does a sound designer want? Think like, what does a video game designer want, right? So you have to put yourself in their shoes. Studio time is cheap, too. Yeah, yeah 100 is. bucks an hour, maybe. And there's a lot of community studios, too. I know in Orlando, we had a, one of our libraries got a huge grant for audio equipment. And so if you have a library card, you can walk in there and record your demo. Wow. Where's this? So 
in Orlando. The it's library car is a thousand dollars. But there's, you know, look for that stuff in your city too. So well, we're here in Atlanta, so I would recommend the neighborhood studio. Yeah. I'm, only, I'm going to go ahead and plug myself and, and our studio in Norcross. Uh, I mean, that's what we do. But mm -hmm. um, for free. <laughs> for a library card, like yeah, yeah, library. Yeah, library card. Yeah. No, but uh, I mean, as, as far as the things that we're talking about, this is great. Sure. So, a library—that's that's amazing. Or that's you know so what? Cool. Students here. I know um, with the Georgia Film Academy going on, yeah. with uh, like all the different branches that they've got now, they have incredibly high quality gear. And you can just check that stuff out. So, I mean, they've got 4K cameras, like Ultra HD 4K cameras that you can just check out. Mm -hmm. Anybody, as long as you're a student and in the program, at, whether it's GSU or Greater, Greater Gwinnett or uh, Cobb, whatever it is, anything around the perimeter, you know, I mean, these things are, are there for you. It's oh. a resource. And, and on that line, actually, that's something you should not exclude. You can rent most equipment, too. So. Uh, even, you know, if you just want to rent a really nice portable recorder, like a Zoom or something like that, there's a camera store in Orlando, it's like 35 bucks you can rent it for the weekend. Nice. You know, so if you don't, right. you know, yeah. yeah, it doesn't need to be expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of recording, let's move on to the actual production. You found your, your, your talent. Uh, now we have a session set up. Who should attend these recording sessions and what do they do? Well, you need me there because I just tell jokes the entire time yeah. and basically derail everything. <laughs> smoke and weed. Meet, yeah, smoke weed. And then, we, and then what happens is you got to get, get a pickup. So actors love me. Um, in, our, in, in our typical recording setup for it, on the game dev side that I've been a part of, it's, there is usually uh, some kind of, some, someone who's there who's basically uh, communicating the game dev side of the direction. Mm -hmm. So that could be like right now at our startup I'm working at now, it's the writer, essentially, um, with help of the creative director. Uh, usually you have an audio uh, representation. Um, a lot of what historically I've been there for is basically to make sure that peop that the, uh, the quality's there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm like, this all sounds good. Oh, it may be, I mean, I might catch some kind of noise, but they usually catch that at the studios that I'm, I've been working with, so. I'm usually there to just kind of quality check and then just to make uh, relationships with everyone. So on the dev side, that's what I've experienced. But pr pretty small, pretty small crew. Definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always been like a producer and yeah. usually town, two sound people. There was like one person running the workstation, monitoring levels, looking for any clipping issues, anything like that. The other sound person taking notes on time code, what takes were good, checking script continuity, that kind of stuff, and then of course your talent. So. Um, Are you there? I'm there. Do you attend? Okay. I am there. <laughs> uh, the, the talent is there, and typically you'll have the, the director there. Uh, and depending on the budget, it, the director will be taking the time code, and then the editor or the audio engineer is the one that's also making sure that the equipment and everything's taken care of. So, mm -hmm. you know, usually the three of us will be there, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So you're dealing with a bunch of cool people that are fun to hang out with, and, you know, the, the the point is to get paid to play, right? I mean, you know, you're recording video games or you're recording animation or anime or whatever it is, the project is you're in your happy place. You know, you're in your safe, fun, happy place. It is the best it's going to be. You're getting paid to, you're literally getting paid to play. There's nothing bad about that. So <laughs> it's a great experience. I, I, yeah, I made a joke about me making jokes, but that's like not really a joke. Like, like that's like when I when I'm on so the when I'm on the Skype or if I'm in the place. I mean, that is really what I try to do is I'm just trying to like loosen everyone up. Yeah. And like, you know, and then <clears throat> you know sometimes I'm there to provide some context for the characters, mm -hmm. and I try to be inspiring with it. You know, be excited so that the the voice actor can can get their head wrapped around it and kind of get in character. And you're right. I mean, it's it's fun. Yeah. It's supposed to be fun. Yes. And, um, and anything that I think you know everyone can do to kind of lighten the mood during a session is is good because I it, it's fun, but it's also you can tell it's really hard work. So it can be grueling. And again, when you especially when you're doing a video game or something that's f it's physical, right? Motion creates emotion, and when you're behind the microphone, and it's it's def it's definitely going to be an active kind of experience. So you'll you'll be sweating. You'll be straining your, your throat, your voice, and that sort of thing. But it, it's a muscle, so you've got to work it out, and you've got to do those things. Now, what's really great is voice actors are incredibly creative people, and they're working with other creatives, but most of the time we're working by ourselves. And so it's sad, because it's just you. 
But when you have Wallace sessions or background sessions, those are the most fun and insane experiences. It's like going to an improv comedy show, like whose line is it anyway? Because everybody is funny and creative. Most of the time we're by ourselves, but then when you get to interact with everybody, it's a natural high. And it's just, it's an incredible experience for everybody to be there because then that's when you get all that riffing and all that improv and it's just, it's a great experience. So, I think. So what are some tips to, to get the best performances out of actors or what are some tips not to do to not get good performances out of actors? <laughs> there was like, that was like a triple negative. What about, <laughs> how do you not not get good performances <laughs> out of your... your uh. Voice actors. Well, you ain't not not gonna get one. <laughs> <laughs> you. No, you gotta know uh, how to speak. Okay. I don't want to answer that one first. That one's hard. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think number one, you have to actually establish some kind of like relationship when the voice talent walks in. It's like you know, be personable and kind of talk to them for a second. It's not like just get the booth and do your job. You know, that kind of thing <laughs> usually gets a little awkward. The other thing is uh, for uh, I found the voice talents that succeed really well. You know, they'll start going through their takes or whatever, and then they'll stop, and they'll actually have a little bit of a conversation with the producer. Hey, is this going in the right direction? Do you need anything more? I could do this, I could do that, you know, and kind of guide them along, because sometimes they're like, man, I never looked at it that way, you know? Mm -hmm. So, certainly, there is a conversation that needs to be, you know, had. Um, and the other thing is, uh, when you're preparing a strip, uh, script for a talent, uh, read it out loud. And this is one of those things that I've seen a lot of producers do. They'll like type it and they'll go, yep, that looks like the right thing. And then they hear it out loud and they're like, that is not the way that was supposed to come across, you know? And it's, it's too, and it's yeah. so hard to like make that correction right on the spot when you're paying a talent to be in the booth and all that kind of stuff. So just as you're producing stuff, read through your script. And then also once you're, you know, done with your script and you print it all out, uh, read through it for like typos and anything else it's like oh i guess i need a period every now and then or something because you know, it's not the talent's <laughs> going to be like you know what's this or if like half the paragraphs on another page then you're going to get the page turning sound and you know that kind of stuff <laughs> or they have to lay it out all funky and yeah make it easy on yourself and and do that kind of due diligence and then from the talent side your job is again to bring the talent so that means you need to do certain preparation in advance that means you need to deal with the mental junk that we all have in our head every single day, all of us, we all have it. You gotta make sure you take that out. So one of the best things you can do for yourself is improv comedy. I mentioned that earlier. Improv comedy shows. If you've never taken the class, if you're not sure yet about how you can do that, just go to the show. Go to the show. Do not go to stand-up. Stand-up is a completely different experience. Stand-up is wonderful and it's funny and it's hilarious, but you're gonna watch people deal with their dysfunctional therapy issues. Improv comedy is an opportunity to spark your creativity. Improv comedy is going to help you improve your timing, improve your pacing. It's going to help you develop an awareness of so many different opportunities in terms of like lateral thinking and just overall, um, it's really going to help you improve your creativity. And then of course working with a coach because that way it will help prepare you for whatever might happen when you are in the booth and there are different things that will happen. It will also help, help you prepare to be uh, to be more responsive to different types of, of personalities from directors and also engineers who don't have personalities because they have their toys and they love their toys and don't <laughs> touch their toys. <laughs> yeah. Actually, one thing I found that's really helpful for voice talent is, you know, it's the first time they're exposed to this character or whatever. Go in the booth with them and, you know, you're not recording and just, like, emote and kind of act out, like, yeah. this is how this character's personality is and kind of get them into the vibe of it, mm -hmm. you know? And then it's like, they now they have a visual representation, uh, representation. they're not just hearing like, Psh, don't pick one, you know? <laughs> which really doesn't tell you anything. Because in those yeah. booths and stuff, sometimes you're not even facing the engineer or anything, so you don't even know what's going on. You're reading and you're like, are they hating me right now? <laughs> they're hating me right now, I know. <laughs> so, you know, it's good to just kind of go in and say, this is the type of personality and have them read it how they think it should sound in their head. And then you're not in that uphill battle like, Okay, I think this is what they want. Yeah. So. so also take acting classes, right? You're a professional. You're going to be a paid professional. That means you need to invest in yourself. You are the product. Okay. The the, the qualities that that are um, your your sense of humor, your your coolness, your edginess, your um, outrageousness, your your boldness, all those different 
aspects of your particular personality that make you who you are, you want to make sure that you can enhance those. But you also want to make sure that you can express those in a way that everyone can relate. So take some acting classes as well. Um, the other, the, like last week or two weeks ago, I directed an actress who was normally an act, like an on-camera talent. Um, and she did her first takes, and I was like, this doesn't sound like what she sounds like on camera. So we stopped the session, and I was like, all right, what do you normally do before you get on camera to get hyped up? And she's like, oh, I usually like go into the bathroom, listen to some music, and kind of dance around. It's really embarrassing. So I was like, go do that. We're going to take five minutes, <laughs> go dance around, do your like mm -hmm. warm-up routine, and get into the mode of how you normally would on camera. Yes. Because, you know, a lot of... People who have never been in front of a mic, it can be intimidating. You're in a little booth and you're right on the mic and you're just kind of like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hey. Are those good? It's like, no, those were kind of flat. So if you, 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 you want to get them kind of loosened up, like you were saying, and doing the routines they would normally do in other, any other job, uh, kind of gets them hyped up. Just something you just mentioned. On, being on camera is a different skill set than being behind the microphone mm -hmm. as a voice actor or voice talent, all right? Uh, perfect example of this, Megamind. Will Ferrell is an incredibly hilarious and very expressive person. Brad Pitt gets by on his looks most of the time. But when Brad Pitt was, well, you know, you know I mean, it's just when he's, you know, just on camera as a, as an, as a character, mm -hmm. he tended to be very flat. And because he's Brad Pitt, apparently the director didn't say, Brad, you need to like liven it up or do something, be different. And so you can really hear that difference just in the overall dynamic expression, right? From Will Ferrell as Megamind to Brad Pitt as the, the boring superhero. A Libra Dutch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So you got the recording, um, and now you have 30,000 lines to deal with. How do you edit that down? How do you stay organized? What do you do to chop this up? What are your processes? Um, so, in detail. Yeah, okay, well, this goes back to the like time code, probably the most important thing, aside from the voice talent actually talking in the mic, the most important thing that's happening in that room. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen producers just flip through pages or just put a couple check marks next to stuff. I'm like, you are never going to find that in a million years. You're never going to know what you were thinking that day. Because the time from recording to the time that you're actually editing that could be weeks. You know, and in that time, you're not going to have any context of like what happened. So be so ridiculously adamant about taking thorough notes. It's like, this take was great. We had to do a pickup here. And also the time code thing is great because I know a lot of times there'll be a, you know, 52 page script or something like that. We're starting on page 30, you know, and now we're going to go to page 10 because we want to make sure we get that in today's session. Now try to find that without notes. You know, it's like you have to listen and you're looking through pages and it's totally annoying. The more, detailed you are in your notes the easier it is going to be and I'm telling you by like weeks so <laughs> that's really important and also uh, a simple thing is if you're doing multiple takes as a lot of people do put a star if you yes. listen to the room as the engineer and say this is the take that people are going yeah that was that was pretty good you know even if they don't say that take make a note you know put a star put a little exclamation point and if they really like it put two stars or something like that and then it's easy when you go through and you pull all your selects not a problem mm -hmm. From an organizational standpoint, <clears throat> that's all really good advice. We do the same thing. Um, I think the other thing that I would say from an audio perspective is um, sort out your naming convention, have that holy war, because it's always a thing. Um, if it's not with someone else on the team, it's going to kind of be with yourself. Like you got to figure out what your, what your naming convention is going to be, because <clears throat> that's another thing that's a big pain if later on down the line you're like, oh, you know what, we should have named this differently. Well, have fun with that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I usually do is I try to think, like, why would, wh why do I care about the name of this thing? So sometimes it might be like, well, I need to name these in such a way that when I'm looking at an, ex an Explorer folder, I'm going to be able to quickly find the line, you know, or some, that might be a reason. Another one might be like, well, I want to do this so that all of these types of lines are together and within those I can very easily sort of sort you know and find the thing I need to, I mean ultimately the file name tends to be I think about finding stuff mm -hmm. and so or maybe about seeing things in a certain chronological order like this is a mission and I want to see them like this you know and these are the sections of it so before you go to the session though like you really should spend some time on it and it's kind of geeky but like it's 
I actually really enjoy the file naming con discussions because it gets yeah, kind of heated <laughs> sometimes because people feel passionately about it. They're like, that's dumb. You shouldn't do it like that. But then when you, you know. But so, like, uh, sort it out beforehand and, like, maybe even put it to the test. Like, maybe make some files with those names and put them in the folder and be like, okay, is this how I want this? Because especially when you're talking about the, the you know, over over a few thousand lines, it's really, it gets pretty unmanageable pretty quick. And the other thing I'd add is sound, toss them in sound minor sometimes also helps, mm -hmm. having a search engine. Mm -hmm. You had a question? Yes, uh, I was gonna ask, uh, do you have the best practices for naming conventions? <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> well, you're crack, you're cracking the egg open? Developers, uh, <laughs> I think about naming conventions in terms of code, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I oh boy. Uh, it really kind of depends on why the naming convention matters to me. I mean, as far as like a best practice, I would say if you, like for me personally, this is kind of, it's super subjective, but like I would say for me personally, I resist, um, I, I go for readability. Like I want to be able to look at the line and not be like, what is that act, you know, like, what do those first three letters stand for again? Oh, I can't remember, you know, uh, and then I would say uh, for linear segments, maybe some kind of numbering in there so that you can sort in a way that's logical in the folder. Um, yeah, I don't if you I, do number, <laughs> use leading zeros. Oh yeah, that's, that's a lot one. of it. Yeah, that's what we do too. I mean, like, is there, do we really need five zero? Yes, yes, you need five zeros. You will. <laughs> I think of the other Because you'll sort it and all of a sudden everybody's like, one, 10, 100, 1,000. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not only that, but then like later if you were, the other thing is maybe go by tens. Mm -hmm. Because then mm -hmm. later if you want to stick Flip a line in between, yeah. you don't want to have to put like some kind of weird A. Totally. You know, it's like 10, you know, 15 A. That's yeah. us. So. Yeah. There's uh, a few, few ideas. We can I, talk after, and I will totally bore you to death about file names. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and also it's important to like have your character name, maybe like the scenario, you know, that kind of thing. The character name, like you don't think about that much, but when you have a lot of characters in a you know, game, that can get unruly. And the other thing is don't put them all in one folder. Like your, your edited takes, break up your folders like you broke up your sections of your scripts, and that way you're going, okay. And then it gets even crazier when you start the whole, like, these are the original recorded, and these are the edited lines, and these are the, you know, we added a, some kind of processed effect to it, and these are the ones that we had to Frankenstein in because the timing changed on something. Yeah. And make sure you keep those in very, very separate directories because the minute you start messing stuff up, then all of a sudden your QA guy is, hey, uh, you notice this whole section here is like the guy's talking at one level and then it drops down to this volume because, you know, the unnormalized lines are mixed with the normalized lines and try to sort that one out. So from a talent perspective, you really have to pay attention how the uh, audition or the recording is supposed to be labeled and you're hearing why now. And a lot of times from the talent side, uh, newbies will just save it as whatever the character is and, and the line. It will drive the director crazy. They will not work with you again. Because again, you know, they're dealing with thousands of lines and it's like, you know, it's like little nitpicky things that matter. The name matters also, whether it's a dash or an underscore, because yeah. Mr. Rickwood here is like, <laughs> underscore, <laughs> always <laughs> underscore. <laughs> 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 dashes. No sorry. space bar. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness. No spaces for sure. Ever, ever. <laughs> See, but some people prefer dashes. Some people prefer you know what? Everybody has their own naming convention, and they're hardcore about it. They're hardcore about it. So as a talent, you need to be sensitive to that and respect that and make sure that you save your file accordingly. Otherwise, it'll just get lost, and then it'll get dumped, and they won't call you. So we definitely want to open up for questions now. If you guys have questions, I'm sure Watson. What, oh, Watson. What do you want? It's going to be hard to talk about renaming software yeah. I, you know what? I, I've only ever used one, but it's the only one I've ever needed, and it always kind of works. And it's kind of, it's, uh, it's called AF5 Rename Your Files. It's super <laughs> old. It's super old and kind of, it's kind of weird. It's super quirky. But you know what? It's always um, done everything that I've ever had to need uh, for VO file re renaming. It's a weird one. Look it up. You have to download some, it's on some obscure website. Too. If you're on Mac OS, like the built in, Renamer is actually really powerful. So mm -hmm. that's usually what I use on, on PC. I use like batch renamer, and it has like a, a menu item where you can just like right click and say start renaming from here, and it pulls up that directory, and then you it has like 
all these options at the bottom of prepend, uh, suffix, or whatever, rename, find, and replace. It's pretty badass. Wow. First off, uh, Ariel, what was that called? What was the thing? It's called, it's called AF5 Rename Your Files. <laughs> 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 right, now, look, I'm not saying it's the best one, are you? Yeah, yeah, it's it's the best best just it works. I'm just saying, like, it has always worked. Um, it's kind of got a really weird old school. It looks like it's like a Windows, you know, 3 1 looking wow. program or something. Yeah. But it, but that's what Batch works. Renamer is. It's like a Windows. <laughs> Windows. Okay, yeah, maybe it's, yeah, okay. Maybe that's just how they do like it. You know what you should do is make one. <laughs> And oh, we will all buy it. Yeah. All right. yeah. <laughs> this is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. One at a time, yeah. Uh, tips for large crowd recordings. Ooh, that's a whole different thing. That's a Watson question. Yeah, all right, so you actually, are you doing, you're talking voice groups of people chanting certain things or like just the sound of people losing their mind? Crowd cheers, jeers, sneers. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to circle back with you after this because that's a whole... That's a whole thing. Did a lot of that. <laughs> uh, you can go to um, trivia nights. Trivia nights. Trivia yeah. nights are decent for like a, a decent crowd. And then like you can always get on the mic with the guy that's running the trivia thing, and the crowd is always going to love that. They're going to be like, "Oh yeah, that's hilarious," because they're already in a good mood, you know, because they're hanging out doing trivia. Yeah. So if you anytime you need a good crowd, but the problem is when you're in a pub or a restaurant or something like that, the quality is not going to be the best. Um, so it really depends on what the environment is. Yeah. But for those kind of things, trivia always really good. What is your follow-up okay, okay. question? Yeah, so I, it was a follow-up question. I just really needed to know what that program was. But uh, my actual question that I want is to ask is it the exe or is uh, it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my actual question is like, say you uh, you do a session and you go through a, a relatively linear um, lines, like a, a bunch of them, and then uh, your producer comes back and is like, "Cool, let's." We just need this line, a new one of this one, a new one of this one, a new one of this one, and like that's it. Um, what I want to know is like, do you have certain ways to keep the continuity flow? Because sometimes if you just put the mic in front of them, you're like, all right, say this, and then they say it, it's not gonna line up uh, like in terms of like how they say it. Like it, it sometimes it sounds artificial. So like, is there any way that you guys uh, kind of take steps to minimize? Pickups. So you're talking about a pickup session. Yeah, I, I would say the one of the easiest ways to do it is play the previous session in their headphones and have them read along with it. Yeah. You know, so then they can kind of get a cadence for a while of like, here's kind of how you were sounding and everything. Kind of get them warmed up and then go into it. We did a session for Paladins that was exactly like that, and we were playing. Uh, it was uh, a Steam crossover, so it was the 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 turd guy from uh, Team Fortress. So we're playing his little trailer ahead of time and he started saying the trailer at the same time and we couldn't tell where he stopped and where the trailer it's was, like was talking. It was weird. <laughs> I was like, wait, was that you just saying that now? Because it kept going. It was like, that's pretty crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. What kind of auditions are open for people that are non-union and non-agents? Lots of them. I do them. all, Smite's all non-union. Every game we do here in Georgia that I've worked on has been non-union, uh, except the Rising Storm was union. But, uh, there's, so there's tons of opportunities. Yeah. VO is a, yeah. dude, the, the voiceover is a global marketplace, all right? You can always find work anywhere around the world. I've actually worked on a video game where the sound designer was in Australia, the video game company was in Canada, Vancouver, Canada, and I recorded here. So you can work right now from home, you know? I mean, it's what, it's, it's 7.30 now here, but it's 7.30 in the morning in Tokyo, and then it's like, what, two o'clock in the afternoon in Sydney? So, VO is a global thing. Don't just look at it as Atlanta. Don't just look at it as non-union versus union, or anything like that. We could probably do two more, so we'll do this guy and then that guy My next. My friend Jesse is uh, mostly blind, he has no central vision, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, he can still play video games and We can also read the line to them and just have them just follow along. So it'd just be like, I'm going to feed you the line. You say it like that. They repeat the line. You you know, you can do as many takes as you want. 
uh, it works really well. Sometimes we've even had a deal where we'll have somebody in the booth with them, you know, kind of coaching them through it. Now that's usually typically done for you're looking for a very specific emotion out of a character and you'll have the producer or the writer or something sitting there and kind of walking it through as if they're on set, you know, so, but that's a great way to go. Uh, one more, we'll, we'll take, we're going to be here after this, but yeah. we, we kind of have to close it down, but we'll take one more question and then, uh, I was just going to ask for the question just before that one, kind of going both ways. With voiceover work being a global market as a voice actor, how do you find these like global opportunities as a person who is looking for voiceover workers? Where do you find these global talents? Tell you what, um, my wife and I have a workshop. It's five hours. It's, we hit you with a, a fire hose of information on how to find work as a voice talent. Everything you need to know, what to say, who to contact, how to contact them. So in terms of the business, uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, it's production directors, production studios, talent agencies, HR directors, creative directors, sound designers, small business owners. It's a matter of you understanding that you are a small business owner and you need to go out and you need to contact these people. Okay. Now, of course, if you have an agent, that may or may not make it easier, but your agent doesn't really care about you. They care about somebody in their pool getting the, getting the job. So as long as somebody in their pool gets the job, Yay, they're happy, they're gonna make money. But in terms of, of you finding work, you've gotta put in that work to do that. And it's much easier to get work and to get repeat work if you're on somebody's short list than if you're constantly going after cattle call after cattle call after cattle call. You don't wanna build your business like that. So you need to make sure you're on somebody's short list. Okay? So I hope that helped and I gave you some names of the people to look up, right? And then you can follow up with us afterwards too. We can actually do one more, so if you want your Yes. But they're not actually directing. Yes. You know, a lot of times I'm I'm kind of this way. I'm a terrible director. Because if you're <laughs> if you're if you're doing things right, I usually don't say anything. So I'll just they'll they'll say, Is this good? I was like, That's perfect. So like just keep doing what I don't want to interrupt it. <laughs> it might be the case, but I, so I mean you gotta read the situation, but like most of the time I'm only gonna interject when it's not going the way I want it. So it's kind of like what you were talking about. In the beginning, you got to establish that relationship. So I'll tell them in the beginning, uh, I don't give a lot of feedback unless you're going wrong. I kind of want you to feel free to be you and do what you do. And then if, if I feel that's not fitting what we thought we were going to do, then I'll stop you and go back and do lines or if there's technical things. So maybe at the beginning of the session, you should set up those guidelines saying, you know what, I need kind of positive reinforcement for what I'm doing. Uh, so can you just like every like five lines just say if I'm, I'm going the right direction or the wrong direction or if that's not what you need if you say like I'm, I'm good like reading this whole thing down without a lot of direction uh, if you're silent I'm, I'm, I feel like that's going to be good so you, establishing that communication from the beginning you can, uh, you can avoid you know the personality clashes that like I would have with you it's like I'm just like Read it like, good, let's go, next, next, this is amazing, you're great, but I'm not gonna say that until the end. I'm gonna add on to that. This, so this is really for voice talent, especially if you're in a booth that is facing the room, the control room. Mm. Do not put a lot of what you're seeing going on in the room into what you think they are thinking about you. Because mm -hmm. it could be yeah. like, they're totally under the gun or the producer gets a call that's totally unrelated to anything that's going on in that room and he's totally stressed out or something like that. Like literally, if they, unless they're telling you like, whoa, hold up, you know, we gotta change this up or something like that. Just focus totally on what you're doing and you know, don't worry about like, what are they talking about in there? Or, you know, cause it, like 90% of the time has nothing to do with anything that's going on in the voice booth, so. Yeah, great questions. Thanks for, for coming. We're gonna do the drawing now, Watson, right? Yeah. Ooh. Get, give some stuff, stuff away. Yes. That backpack, wow, Look cool. at this. Giving that away. <laughs> that's not amazing sounding. That's <laughs> <laughs> We're sure. safe on the right. <laughs> Smart Lab Plus by Rode Microphone. Oh, nice. nice. Smartphone. And do your demo. Don't do your demo on the phone. No, do it on audition. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do it on audition. You don't do it on just went over this, man. So you're auditioning on this. So you download the free app. This thing is $66 retail. 
but it sounds great. My daughter did a college speech class and the camcorder was too far away with a stereo mic and noisy. I put this on her, put my phone on airplane mode, put it in her pocket, and replaced the audio from this mic and the press was like, wow, she got a name. So, so, <laughs> uh, awesome. right. so very kind of road microphone. So Six zero four six eight nine. You have a ticket? I don't even have a yeah, ticket. Yeah, I didn't get a ticket. <laughs> 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 All right. Woo! Oh, my God, look at him. Yeah. Check his ticket, man. <laughs> check his ticket. Yeah, check his ticket. Don't just believe him. <laughs> so tomorrow at 3.30, I'm going to give out more of that same mic. And then on Sunday at 10 o'clock, a lot more microphones, bigger ones. Ooh. Still. No, no, we're going to get new tickets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, swag, first come, first serve. I'm going to have uh, some hats, t-shirt, gift cards uh, from various companies. Uh, very, very cool, generous companies. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. Awesome. Awesome.